Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Is being filled with the Holy Spirit. And they talked about being filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, all through the songs, all through the uh, sister um, Priscilla was sharing about being filled with the Holy Spirit. And I want to just share with you from, from a few verses of Scripture this morning about being filled with the Spirit. Now, I don't know about you, but I know that it is indicative to, for us to be filled with the Spirit. I believe that all of God's Word says very plainly and very clearly, in fact, doesn't only state it, but commands us to be filled with the Spirit. Now, many of us have been filled with the Spirit. Many of us have, been, have experienced what the day of Pentecost has, and we've, uh, we've got the, uh, the infilling of the Holy Ghost, and we speak in tongues, and we, we have the gifts of the Spirit in, in operation. But what I'm talking about is being, being, be being filled with the Holy Spirit. That how many know that you need to continuously, repeatedly be filled with the Holy Spirit? And so my question this morning is this. What was the purpose of this mandate that commands us to be filled with the Spirit? What was the purpose? Well, some would say to be filled and controlled and empowered, but what, what would you say if I asked you this question? What's the purpose of this mandate that commands us to be filled with the Spirit? I believe what the answer to this question is, and the main purpose, I believe, is for us to have discernment. You would, you would be amazed how many Christians out there have lost their ability to discern. There can be a false preacher, a false teacher up on the platform, and they could say all kind of things mixed in with all kind of Christian cliches. And I've seen people sit there and go, Amen. And I went, Oh, no. <laughs> we need discernment so badly in the church of Jesus Christ today that it, it's almost to the point where anything goes. Anything, will, anything that happens, anything goes, is fine. But we need discernment. Amen? Amen? Jesus said in the last days, one of the greatest uh, weapons that would be cast against the church is deception. How many times Jesus said, be not deceived. Let no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying this and saying that, and doing miracles and doing all kinds of things. He says, do not be deceived. So in order to not be deceived, we've got to have the anointing or we've got to have the infilling of gift of discernment in our spirit. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. Let's look for a moment. The scripture I'm going to be using this morning as my reference point today is Ephesians chapter 5, verse 16 to 18. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 16 to 18. If you have your Bibles, it'll be good if you turn there. It's good to get used to turning the pages in your Bible. If you don't have a Bible, it'll be up on the screen. The Bible says in, in chapter 5, verse 16, it says this. Redeeming the time. Redeeming the time. What does that word redeem mean? Now, if we talk about it on the salvation platform, we understand what redeem, redemption is. It's a buying back. But let me say this, the word redeemed in this particular context of scripture says it means by payment of a price to recover from the power of another. To recover from the power of another. And how many know that there's a dichotomy that goes on in our, in our, in our being? The flesh wars against the spirit, the Bible says. Amen? There's a war that goes back and forth, the spirit and the flesh. And to redeem the time means to take back or to recover from the power of another. In other words, God wants us to redeem the time, meaning that we need to look and see what, what part of our life we're wasting time. 
He wants us to look at the process of what we do, what we say, where we go, and to redeem that time and to take it back from the power of my own will, my own wanting to do something, and leaving it over into what God's will is for our life. And the reason why God wants us to do this, the reason why he wants us to redeem the time, is because the days are what? They're evil. All you've got to do is turn the news on and see what's happening all over the world. Some of the foreign nations of the world, Christians are being beheaded. They're being killed for the, for the, for the uh, testimony of Jesus Christ. Many are being persecuted. Many are thrown in jail because of their commitment to Christ. But what's happening here in America? We're seeing our rights slowly being eroded away from us. And unless we have discernment, especially in these last days, where you're going to see something tremendously important happening in the next few years, you're going to see a giant one-world church come into order, and you're going to see it's called the ecumenical movement, and what's going to happen is those who do not join this one world church will be considered heretics and they'll be considered uh, outside the, the loop of things of progression and they will be persecuted. But unless we have discernment to understand and to know the true church, we could be fooled. The Bible says, know this in the last days, many shall, say the word many with me, shall fall away from what? The faith. Giving heed to what? Seducing spirits and doctrines, teachings of devils. That's why if someone ever says to you, we don't need doctrine, they don't know what they're talking about. Well, I've heard people say, well, doctrine divides. Doctrine does not divide. Error divides from truth. Error is the one that shoots off from truth. It's always error that makes, makes the change, not the truth. The truth shall remain forever. God said in his word, he says, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word will never pass away. This word and this Bible that you have in your hand will stand forever. Every jot, every tittle, every period, every comma will come to pass. God said it, I believe it, I believe it and that settles it. Hallelujah. And we need to redeem the time because the days are evil. And he says, wherefore, or in other words, be ye not unwise, don't be unwise. If you're not redeeming your time, if you're not discerning the time we're living in, if you're not discerning the time and the wasted time that we so occupy our lives with, and we leave the kingdom of God second best, if we're not doing that, we're being unwise. Because God wants us to understand what the will of the Lord is. If I asked you the question this morning, what is God's will for you? What would you say? Well, I'm here in uh, Massachusetts, so it must be God's will, or I'm here or I'm there, I'm doing this or doing that. But what is his will? How do we understand his will? How do we get to know his will? Well, how many know that the Bible says the natural mind is enmity with God? Your natural mind cannot figure out what God's will is. So how do we understand or how do we know what God's will is? Well, let's look at Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says this. Is he up there yet? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you what? Present. God never forces you. God always wants you to present. He'll never, never ask you to, uh, he'll never say to you, uh, uh, you know, you've got, I want you to do this. No, he gives us the option. He has commandments, but the, the commandments are given, but he'll never force us to make those decisions apart from our own will. We have to present. God says that you are to present your what? Your bodies as a what? A living sacrifice. Hallelujah. How? Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Verse 2 is the, is the scripture I want to use this morning. And this is so happening in the church. It, 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 it just bothers my spirit. 
And be not conformed to this world. The church is trying to conform itself to the world so that the world will accept the church. Can I tell you, that's not how it works. How it works is when you are different, when the Spirit of God is living in you and you are different from the world, they look at you and say, something is different. I knew you when. I knew what you did. I know how you lived. I know what was the story. But when you were at 16 years old, God came and did a marvelous transformation in your life and began to do a new work in you. He transformed us by how? By the renewing of the way that you and I think. By the renewing of our minds. Because before I was a Christian, I thought I was great. I thought I was okay. I made money in the nightclubs and I played in the nightclubs and I had all the women and all the partying I wanted to have and I thought I was good. Until the day of reckoning when the Bible says your sin will find you out. And all of a sudden things started to turn for the, for the worse. And I was like, God, what's, you know, I said, what's, what's going on? You know, something's not. And my neighbor came to me, and I'll never forget this. He came and he told me he was only 16 years old. Thank God for the youth. Amen. Amen. 16 years old, he came and he told me that Jesus loved me. I told him, I says, I know that. I'm Catholic. <laughs> yeah, I was Catholic. I went to church twice a year, Easter and Christmas. But I didn't know Jesus. And he came and he told me several times he'd see me sitting in my car and I was getting high, smoking marijuana. He'd come and knock on the window and he would tell me, I want you to know. I said, yeah, I know Jesus loves me. But there came that one confrontation, that one instance, when those words rang deep into my soul and I cried out to God and said, God, I need you. Come into my life. Be the Lord and master of my life. And from that moment on, and he began to transform me and he began to renew my mind to think the things that he wanted me to think and to do the things he wanted me to do. So your mind needs to be renewed. That's how you know and understand and not be unwise, but know what the will of the Lord is. By the renewing of your mind, by, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Your mind must be renewed in order to find the perfect will of God for your life. Praise God. Hallelujah. Going back to Ephesians chapter 5. He says in verse 18, And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess. In other words, don't let the fleshly things overtake you. Don't let the worldly system and the way that people deal with issues. So many people, I know I was one of them, I dealt with all of my problems with drugs and alcohol. That's how I, I dealt with my problems. Some of us have so many internal problems. So many of us have things in our hearts that we've not told anyone. And they're, we're harboring inside because we feel like we, have, we can't talk to anybody. Or that we would seem to look like we're weak if we talk to somebody about our problem. And they're suffering internally, isolated, and lonely and depressed. But be not drunk with wine excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Hallelujah. Be filled with the Spirit. Now, this in the Greek is the present imperative, what's called the present imperative, which means it's a continuous, repeated filling. It's not like when you were at the, you know, when you were at the day of the time of Pentecost, when you got filled with the Holy Ghost, began to speak in tongues. That's different. Now, we're filled there, but we need to continually be filled with the Spirit. That should be an ongoing process in your life. Every day when you get up, Lord, let me be filled with your spirit today. Let my mind be renewed today because, Lord, in this day, you know everything. In this day, there's going to be choices that I can make that will be against your will. Help me, Lord, to walk in the spirit. So what do we need to discern? 
Yes, we can need to discern evil, but when it comes to our own personal life in this particular portion of Scripture about redeeming the time, because the days are evil. And where we need to be not unwise, but, be un but have understanding what the will of the Lord is. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But what are we going to discern and what is the thing, the major thing we need to discern in this particular context? Let's look at Galatians 5.16 this morning. Check my time here. Galatians 5.16. This I say then. Walk in the what? Walk in the what? How do I do that? I'm walking in the flesh. I'm walking now as I'm talking to you in the flesh. So it's not something in the that he's talking about here. He's talking about in the, in the spiritual realm. Walk in the spirit. That doesn't mean walking around speaking in tongues all day. What is a, why does a person walk in the first place? To get someplace. To get from one point to another point. When you walk in the spirit, you're getting from the point of where you are thinking in the natural to thinking in the spiritual. That's what walking in the spirit means. It means not thinking and walking all, every, all day in the natural of with your natural decisions, doing what you want to do 24-7 all the time. It's to walk in the spirit is to find out God's will and God's mind for you for that day. And then to walk in it. You say, but pastor, I have to go to work. Absolutely. But when you're going to work and you go to work, say to the Lord, I want to walk in the spirit where I have to work. God, I pray that you will use me. Give me discernment so that I can discern your will to know what you want me to do while I'm at work. And the first thing he'll tell you is, of course, you've got to work. But the second thing also is to be an example, to let that light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father which is in heaven. He says, what does I say then? Walk in the Spirit. Go in a direction of, walk in the, to a place where you'll be walking in the Spirit, and when you're doing that, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You say, well, I'm a Christian for years, and I don't have any lust of the flesh. Well, we better go back to deception again, and you need discernment. <laughs> because we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. Amen? That's the truth. But here he says, walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. To be filled with the Spirit is to be filled, controlled, and empowered. In other words, God's asking you to walk in the Spirit, but He's also going to give you the ability to do it. Amen. He's going to empower you to do it. He's going to bring a, uh, a controlling to you that you'll be able to take what God gives you and fulfill it in your life. Galatians 5.25 says this, a few verses down. If we live in the Spirit, there's a difference between walking and living. If I'm walking to my home, I'm, I'm not there yet, but I'm going to get there. It's a progression. But when I live in a place, it means I've chosen to make that place the place where I dwell. And can I tell you something? Those of us that may suffer from anxiety, from stress, from many of the complications of our job, or our families, our problems, if we would only live in the Spirit and hear God. You know, uh, let me give you an example. Husband and wife. How many times you and your husband, or you and your wife, or you and a friend, or whatever, got into a heated di discussion? That ever happened to you? Yep. Right here. Pastor admits it. And how many times did God ever speak to you and say, don't say that? 
Don't say what you're going to say. And we didn't obey. And we said what was on our minds. Boy, did that cause a lot of problems. And you say, well, God, why don't you want me to say anything? Don't you know this person's wrong? <laughs> God says this in his word in Proverbs. Where there is no wood, the fire goes out. You can get into a heated discussion and fight and claw and punch and do all kinds of things, but if that person has no ammunition, if that person has no wood on the fire, it will not burn long. And sometimes it's just better, that's wisdom, to not say anything. If we live in the Spirit, let us also Walk in the Spirit. So in other words, walking comes out of or stems from or exceeds from living. Some people say, well, you know what? I tried that, but it don't work. That's because you're, you're waffling back and forth. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Well, pastor, how long does that take? A lifetime. You'll never reach the perfection of it. But it's the desire of your heart, it's the desire of God for you to walk in, and live in the Spirit. As I said one time, you're not, you're, not, you're not here on earth hoping to go to heaven. You're seated in heavenly places, and your earth is only you're passing through. You're only here passing through. You're only here for a short time, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 years, whatever it is, your lifespan will be. And then after that, you have eternity. So walk in the Spirit, to live in the Spirit is to walk in the Spirit. In other words, your mind is being renewed, you're redeeming the time, you're looking at that and saying, okay, what I need to do is I need to ask God some things. How many ask God for things in your life? How many of you uh, seek God for your decision making? Amen. If you don't seek God in your decision making, then you're making your own decision. And, and it's, can I tell you that God's not... Uh, God's not a casino? God is not a casino. In other words, what I'm saying is finding God's will isn't throwing the dice and hoping that you make the right choice. That's not what God is. God wants to lead you. John, in the Gospel of John, God's word says that in, I think it's 14, 15, or 16 chapter, he says, the Holy Spirit shall lead you and guide you. Oh, the very Greek word for Holy Spirit is the parakletos, which means that he will come and he will grab you by the hand and he will walk with you and he will show you which way to go. So when you walk in the Spirit, also know that the Holy Spirit is there to lead you. Hallelujah. Because we're dumb sheep. Amen. Doesn't matter how many degrees you have or how, many how much education you have, you're a dumb sheep. Sheep are naturally dumb. And we're the sheep of his pasture. So we need guidance. We need understanding. God says for you to get there. Well, I get it from pastor. No, you don't get it from me. Now, if you're stuck in a situation and you want to talk about it, we can talk about it, pray about it, look in the Word, see what the Word of God says, because I want God's will. I don't want my way for you. I want God's will for you, and I'll try to give you the counsel from God's Word. But ultimately, it's up to you to decide what you're going to do. It's up to you to renew your mind. It's up to you to walk in the Spirit. It's up to you to walk in the Spirit. It's up to you to live in the Spirit. How you and I appease God or how you and I please God is not by walking in the flesh. For the flesh profits nothing, the Bible says. It doesn't profit anything. But Romans chapter 8 verse 4 says this. That the righteousness of the law might be. Look, look at this. Might be. Didn't say it would be. It said might be. Because there's a conditional clause after that. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. And here's the condition. Who walk not after the. But after the. 
If you're walking in the direction, going to a place in the flesh, the righteousness of the law won't be fulfilled in you. But if you walk in the Spirit, the righteousness of the law will be fulfilled in us. So that way you can stand before God instead of always going to God and saying, God, I'm not worthy. God, I'm, I'm no good. God already knows that. <laughs> he already sent his word. There's none righteous, no, not one. Take the most righteous person you want in the world. The Bible says his righteousness or his, her righteousness is filthy rags. If your righteousness or my righteousness could appease God, then there would be no need for Jesus to come and live a holy life and die on the cross for us. We cannot do it. Jesus Christ was the only one to satisfy the wrath of God and the justice of God by living the entire law blameless, sinless. And so his righteousness is given to us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Because if you walk after the flesh, you shall die, the Bible says. Spiritual death. Listen to what he says. But after the spirit. For they that are after the flesh, next verse, do what? Mind the things of the flesh. So being filled with the Spirit, being continuously, repeatedly filled with the Spirit is a renewing of your mind. It is a recovery from the power of another. And so we have to ask God, God, please, I don't want to make this decision. How many of us did that in jobs? You, you went and you got a job. You said, I, I'm, I'm going to take this job. I could tell you one of a pastor I know. This pastor friend of mine, he was my pastor at the time. and uh, We were down to Cape Cod, and he was pastoring this little church, maybe about 60, 70 people. And then he got an opportunity to go to another church which was bigger, more money, more prestige, more, more uh, you know, he would be more recognized. And so he prayed and said, God told him to go to that church. And I felt, I said no to myself. I don't believe that's the will of the Lord. Always understand, bigger is not always better. Amen. Newer is not always better. And so he was there at that church one year, and he ended up leaving, and they owed him over $20,000 and back pays, and it was just terrible, terrible experience for him. In fact, he ended up leaving the denomination and going to another denomination. It's so important to discern the Lord, especially in the last days, redeeming the time because the days are evil. And more and more things are happening. More and more things are happening out there as far as teaching, and, and if we're not solidly founded on God's word, you're going to be fooled. If you don't have discernment, if you're not filled with the Spirit, if you're not trying to discern through your, through your earthly mind, but through your spiritual mind, you'll be able to withstand the, the, the uh, attack of the enemy. Have you ever heard the terms hyper-grace? Anybody ever heard that term? Hyper-grace? It's a teaching out there that's out there. I could name you some preachers that are preaching that on television right now, and you'd go, wow have 20, 30,000 people in the church. Preaching is hyper, hyper grace. And what that means is that because God has forgiven you of your past, present, and future sins, there's no need for you to confess any sins in your life. Did you hear me? That's the teaching that's out there. It's hyper grace. Since God forgives you, past, present, and future, all at the same time, there's no need for you to confess your sins. Well, that's not what my Bible says. First John says... If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. But if you don't know this Bible, so what are people are doing is they're going out and they're sinning and they're, having, they're making the grace of God into lasciviousness. Paul talked about that. Paul talked about lasciviousness, turning the grace of God into lasciviousness, a license to go out and do whatever you want to do, live how you want to live, sin and not worry about it because God's got it covered. That's not true. That is not true. That's hyper grace. 
Again, if you want to know what true grace is, and I've been thinking about doing a study on grace. True biblical grace is found in, second, uh, in Titus chapter 2, where the Bible says that the grace of God teaches us an eye on godliness and worldly lust and to live righteously, soberly in this present age. That's what true grace does. It doesn't just cover and you continue living the way that you live. So it's not biblical grace, if it's any other thing than I had just mentioned. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is what? And what else? So many people want peace. That's the way you get it. How you get the peace is not to be carnally minded, not to let the enemy run all over your mind. When the enemy comes to me and tells me, oh, you know what? You're no good. You're this and you're that and you're this and you're that. And who do you think you are? You're no good. You know what I tell him? I say, you're absolutely right. Because the Bible says there is no one good. No, not one. So I'm in agreement with the scriptures, not with you, devil. But I'm in agreement with the scriptures that in me is no good thing. In my flesh, there's no good thing. I, can, I am just as guilty in the flesh as a murderer, a rapist, or anybody else because there's no difference in sin. <gasps> Somebody's looking at me like, what are you talking about, Pastor? What I'm talking about is, is if you're a liar, hello, you're just as guilty as a murderer. If you have hatred in your heart towards somebody, you're just as guilty as a murderer. Jesus said so. If you look at a woman with lust in your heart, you committed adultery with her already, you're just as bad as the adulterer. Hello? Because man looks at the outward appearance, God looks at the heart. But to be spiritually minded is life. Spiritual life. That's why so many Christians don't have any life. They're just trudging through, through Christianity. They're just trudging through. How are you doing? Barely making it, Pastor. I'm barely making it this day. I'm weighed down with so many things. Why? God said in his word, Jesus said these words, cast all your care upon me. When you can't handle it, when I can't handle it, this is part of walking in the Spirit. Cast all your care on Him, for He cares for you. Amen. Don't cast your care upon the pastor because <laughs> I can't handle it. You can tell me about it and I'll pray with you, but I'm going to give you these scriptures to help you to be able to apply them to your life because that's my job. It's to help you apply the scriptures to your life so that in the last days you can stand redeeming the time because the days are evil. Buying back or taking back that time or to recover from the power of another. Because the, de the days are evil. They are. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. What are some of the ways I can tell if I'm walking in the Spirit? What's the one, ways, one, one, of the, one of the ways that you can tell if you're walking in the Spirit? Carry a spiritual flesh meter? No. No such thing. But you can do this. Galatians 5, chapter 5, verse 22. I don't need to have discernment to know that if somebody has a fruit stand, they're not selling fish. Right? If I see a fruit stand, I know one thing. They're selling fruit. They're not selling cars. So if I'm going to buy a car, I don't go to a fruit stand. I go to a car dealer. You can know them by their fruits. So Galatians 5 says this. But the fruit of the Spirit 
and it is the spirit that we want to live in and walk in, you'll be able to determine how much or to what degree you are walking in the spirit or living in the spirit by how much these, th these things, these fruits are manifested in your life. Let's look at it. The first one that is there is what? Love. Now, I love you, okay, but don't get on my goat, okay? That's conditional love. But unconditional love doesn't matter. I'm going to love you unconditionally. And that's the kind of love. This is the agape love that God's talking about. So the first fruit is love. So if you're hitting your husband upside the head with a baseball bat, Wives, you're hitting your husbands over the head with a frying pan. And I don't mean that literally. I mean that with your tongues. Where's the love? Remember that song? Where is the love? Where's the love? You can know if you're not, you know, <laughs> so many times when you drive... You can tell whether you have love or not. <laughs> and that's one of the areas God's still working on in me. When I drive and I absolutely see idiots that should not be on the road, I don't know how they got their license. And I tell God that too. God, how did this person ever get their license? Or they cut you off or they, they you know, you know what I'm talking about, right? You could, you, some of you, sometimes you want to follow them, you know? Are you speed up a little further? You know, what's that? Road rage? road rage? It's not to that point of road rage, but you know, but you you know, you like to tell them a piece of your mind. You know what I mean? But love overlooks a matter. Love overlooks a matter. So one of the fruits you would see in your in your life if you're walking in the spirit, if you're living in the spirit, is love. Isn't that wonderful? The love of God. The next thing you're going to have in your life is what? Joy. Now, a lot of times, joy is, is acquainted with or is linked to our feelings. If you feel joy, you're joy. If you don't feel joy, you're not joy. But that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said this. He said, my joy shall be in you. You hear what I'm saying? He didn't say your joy. He said, my joy shall be in you. When you have the joy of the Lord, it becomes what? Your strength. For the joy of the Lord is my strength. You can, you can have the joy of the Lord in the most difficult times in your life. That doesn't mean you're going to be happy with a smile and everything's going to be okay. No. But you have this joy. I remember that old song I used to hear sung. And uh, 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 where I ever first heard it, and I remember even hearing this before I was a Christian, was on the Beverly Hillbillies. How many remember the Beverly Hillbillies, right? Remember little Granny? She used to sing that song. I got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Remember that? And she was a real fiery old lady. But she had that joy deep down in her heart. You know, that's what we need it. Deep down in our person. That joy of the Lord, which is our strength, to take us through every day, to redeem the time, to get that time back because we understand that there needs to be a recovery from the power of another that is trying to rob, steal, and kill and destroy your faith and your walking in the Spirit with God. And then here's the third thing. Everybody wants peace. But I believe that God has these in order. That if you have real love, and if you have real joy, you're going to have real peace. Because you're having love to God first, you're, having, you're, enjoying, your, you're enjoying your salvation in God, and then you're going to have true peace because you're right with God. Love, joy, peace. So many people are fighting for peace. You look all over the world, they're fighting for peace. People that have gone to Israel, and uh, Priscilla could tell you when she got off the plane, the first thing you notice is peace in the midst of all that turmoil that's going on all around them. But there's a presence of peace 
Why is there a presence of peace in Israel, not in that country? Well, I don't think Jesus came to America. When Jesus was in Israel, and he was telling his disciples, he said, he said this to, and these, these were who he was talking to. He was talking to the Jews. He said, my peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, but I give to you. And to this day, when you get off the plane in Israel, you can sense this overwhelming presence of peace. Because Jesus spoke it, and it was so. And it will always be so. But they won't have everlasting peace or true peace as a nation until the return of Jesus Christ. Praise God. Hallelujah. Here comes another fruit of the Spirit, which shows whether you're... And these, these things are little barometers. You know, some of us have a little bit. Some of us have a little bit more. Some of us have a little bit less. You know, how we can improve that is up to you in prayer with God. And you ask him about these things in this message today. hope you get a CD so that you can take it home and re-listen to it and understand what God wants from you. And then he says here, long-suffering or suffering long. The only way that we can suffer long through things is by walking and living in the Spirit and having the mind of the Spirit. How many of you, honestly, would have walked out of situations you are in a long time ago if it wasn't for God? Okay. You understand that the reason why is because in the natural mind, it's like, hey, I'm out of here. <laughs> but because God is doing something in your life and has renewed your mind, now, I'm not saying to stay in a relationship that's bad or stay in a situation that's hurtful to yourself, okay, that could actually damage or kill you, you know. But long-suffering, you suffer long is one of the things that you will see when you walk in the Spirit, you're going to have to deal with each and every one of these things that I'm telling you this morning. Look at this one, gentleness. This is one of those things of walking in the Spirit and living in the Spirit. You'll be a gentle person. Doesn't mean you'll never lose your temper. But this is what God's ideal is for you and I, is to be gentle. How about goodness? See, this is a goodness that comes not to obtain righteous standing with God, but it's a goodness that God said he would produce in you. Remember, the Bible says, he who hath begun a good work shall what? Complete it. That goodness that God has done in your life. Some people, when they're, before they're saved, they are the most stingiest people you ever met. They won't give you a dime. They won't, they won't give you the time of day. They could kill us. They're very selfish. But when they become a Christian, what happens? Goodness. They see a person in need. They want to help. They see somebody that needs food. They want to help. It's apart from the natural goodness of man. See, because America gives things away all the time. All you got to do is look and see what <laughs> the things that we give away. We're an entitled nation, entitlement nation. That needs to be... Corrected, by the way. There's a lot of misjudgment on that. But anyway. Okay, the next thing is what? Faith. Are you a person of faith? Do you walk by faith? Or do you walk by sight? See the difference? Walking in the Spirit, living in the Spirit. Walking by faith. You see how God has blessed you by, by walking in the Spirit, not walking in the flesh? Well, I don't know if I should take that job. It's less money. Hello? I could tell you a time, one time when I was going to go on a mission trip. This was years ago before I was married. My first trip to Guatemala. I was in a church and God spoke to me through the missions that came. He said, I want you to go to Guatemala. I said, Okay. So I, I, wasn't, I, I had left the nightclub business. I had a new car. I sold my car. I sold everything I had so I could fulfill the will of God for my life. My father thought I was cuckoo. I was crazy. Something was wrong with me. I must have been on drugs. Or the drugs must have affected me. But anyway, so I, I said, okay, Lord, now I need a job. I, can't, I, I left my job. I don't have any money. 
And my father came to me and he told me, he says, hey, he says, you want a, you want a job? Because <laughs> he worked at the New Bedford Country Club. He was a bartender there. He says, you want a job? I said, doing what? He said, washing dishes. Now, you have to understand, at the time, I was making very good money as a musician. I said, how much does it pay? He said, four fifty an hour. I said, I'll go check it out. Okay, so I went in there and talked to the man. The man said, hey, yeah, if you want the job, you know, you can have the job. You know, I, and I said, okay. And I, I, I said, well, I'll let you, can I let you know? He said, sure. I'm, this, is, this is really the truth. Okay? I walked out of that place. When that screen door closed, I and God had an argument. I walked out of there and I said, God, after I saw what we had to do, the cleaning of the pans, lifting up the mats, cleaning all the grease from the kitchen and all that stuff, all that for four fifty an hour, I, me and God were having it on. I'm telling you right now. We were, we were going at it, me and God. And I said, God, I'm not working there. I'm not working there. I don't care. Uh, I'm not doing that. I'm not lowering myself to do all this stuff. And as I'm walking to my car, the Holy Ghost is getting a hold of me, and I start crying. Well, God, I'm not working there. God, I'm not going to work there. God, I'm not going to do Okay, God, I'll work there. <laughs> and so I went there, and I worked, and I slaved like a dog. And I was saying, God, is this really your will for me to work like this? I mean, you know, you get that grease smell from the kitchen, you know, and the fry laters and all that, and you smell like a French fry. I said, God, is this really your will? Is it really your will for me to go to Guatemala? Maybe I misheard. Maybe something's wrong. I don't understand why you have me. In this. And I'd go home, and I'd be, I was a young man, and I'd be sore as anything, and I'd be like, oh, God. No. And then the next day I went into work, and... The guy says to me, he says, uh, hey, I got a new employee that's coming to help in the kitchen. I was like, oh, thank, thank you, Jesus. I need the help, right? He says, yeah, he doesn't speak that good of English, but he understands a little bit. So uh, we start working together, and I look at him. Now, I have to understand I never traveled anywhere in my life, okay, overseas, never did. I look at him, and I said, uh, I forget whatever his name was. It's been th over 30 years, so you can't expect me to remember everything. So I said, um, I said where are you from? Guatemala. Where are you from? Guatemala. And the Lord used that to confirm to me that's what you're here for. You just keep cleaning the pots and the pans and everything. And then finally came the time when my trip was coming and, and I went in and, and I, I resigned and I, you know, from my position and I, I got my money, saved my money and I paid my trip and everything like that. And I'm sitting home and the guy says, okay, I'm going to pick you up at 1 o'clock. 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock, no guy. God, do you really call me to go to Guatemala? Do you really want me to go? So while I'm waiting, I turn the TV on. How many remember PTL? Remember PTL? PTL comes on. Jim Baker, he's interviewing a guy from Guatemala. I said, okay, God, I got the point. Soon after that, I says, Lord, I'm ready. The phone rang. He said, I'll be there in 20 minutes. He was there. He picked, up, picked me up, and we drove all the way across the nation in a bus with 40-some-odd people. I want to talk about a trip that was wonderful. It was one of the best trips I ever had, and I've been to Guatemala five times since then. We have a church in Guatemala. We have a school that we planted in Guatemala, and God has done great things. But you've got to have faith. Do you have faith? If you're walking in the Spirit, if you're living in the Spirit, you're going to be a person of faith. You're going to believe God. This church started out of my living room with my wife and I at the first service preaching to nobody but each, but each other. God said, do it. I did it. And look what the results are. Yeah. Praise the Lord. It's faith. You've got to step out in faith. I have a friend of mine. I told him many years ago. He said, oh, we're going to have this big ministry in, in uh, Kentucky and blah, blah, blah. I said, Good. I said, step out in faith. He said, no, I'm waiting on the Lord. I said, no, don't, no, 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 don't, 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 don't give me that. I'm waiting on the Lord's stuff. Okay. If you have faith because God said to do a, do a ministry, you don't need any more instruction. Go do it. 
And as you're doing it, God will give you more insight and more revelation and more direction. But if you expect God to give you more and you're not even doing the very basics, he's not going to do it. He's not obligated to do it. Okay, faith. Meekness. Meekness. Temperance. Even tempered. He says, against such there is no law. So walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Being filled with the Spirit. How many of you this morning when you woke up, be honest now, when you opened your eyes, said, Lord, fill me with your Spirit today. Praise God. There's a few of you that did. God bless you. You need to do that. But see, what happens is we get caught in this, we get caught in this little cocoon called routine. Don't we? We get up, we do the same thing every day. We get up from bed, alarm goes off, we reach off, probably hit the snooze, probably turn it off. We get up, we go to the bathroom, we read a little bit, do whatever we gotta do, jump in the shower, right? Go back into our room, get dressed, go get something to eat, right? Go brush our teeth, get in our cars and go wherever we have to go, right? Do you know sometimes God wants you to maybe take a sidetrack? And I'm going to close with this. Very quick story. My car broke down, not the one I got now, many years ago before I was married. Had a little sports car, Fiat Brava. Nice five-speed. It was cool. <sighs> broke down. So I, I live in New Bedford, and this place that fixed them was in a Kushnet, Kushnet for Haven line. And so uh, I went over. I was called him up. He says, bring it in by such and such a time. I said, okay. So I called my neighbor. I said, neighbor, can you give me a ride? She said, sure, I'll give you a ride. Okay, so the time came, I, I called her up. I, Can you give me a ride? No answer. I said, Lord, what's the story? I can't get a hold of it. He said, walk. <laughs> now, if you understand where a cushion it, what I'm talking about, the cushion it where, uh, I think it's one of the roads there, right where that seafood hut is, Alden Road there, yeah, and Main Street. So from there, he said, walk. He said, yeah, walk. Take some tracks with you and pass out tracks as you go. So I called the lady again. <laughs> I said, you're supposed to take me. Where are you? No answer. Make a long story short. Okay, I took my car, dropped it off, blah, blah, blah. I'm walking back, and I see a guy sitting down. I gave my track. Hey, God bless you. You know, read that when you get a time. All right, I'm walking up Cogsall Street. You know that little bridge there on Cogsall Street there? Right near the 7-Eleven, there's a bridge, a little tiny bridge there. I'm walking over the bridge, and all of a sudden, I stop, and I look to the side. And I'm not kidding you, and I'm not exaggerating, okay? So don't think it's my sanguine temperament coming out. I looked down, and I saw these silver fish about this big by the hundreds along the shore. I was amazed. And I, and I said, my Lord. I sat down on the, on the uh, guide rail like this, and I'm watching them and looking at them. Okay. Now, you say, well, what was that all about? Hindsight now I can tell you, but at the time I didn't know. That was God delaying me on that bridge. So I'm looking there, and then I just felt the need to get up, and I got up, and I start walking, and I get to the middle of the bridge where the green railing is, and I look over the railing like this, and all of a sudden I hear a car stop right on the middle of the bridge. No, toward, the, toward this side, though. You know, he wasn't blocking traffic and go around him. I hear the door close. The man runs on that side of the bridge, looks over, comes on this side of the bridge, looks over, He's getting ready to go back in his car and the Lord said, give him a track. I said, excuse me, can I give you something? He said, what's that? I said, it's about Jesus. He closed his door, he came over, he put his hands on the railing, he says, I need to get my life right with God. He said, my life's so messed up. I've been watching Billy Graham on TV, but I don't know how to get right with God. He said, I need to get to church to get right with God. I said, you don't need church to get right with God. I said, you can get right with God right here. He bowed his head and gave his heart to Jesus right there on the bridge. See, to walk in the Spirit, my flesh wanted a ride home. <laughs> okay. But God had another plan. And I gave that man a church in the name of a pastor and a phone number, and I said, here, you need to go to this place. He was so thrilled and happy. He was crying. He said, oh, thank you, thank you so much. He got in this car and he took off. And then the Lord spoke these words to me. He said, I will make you a fisher of men. I just got saved a few months earlier. And I just began to weep. I, I fell right there on Cogsall Street, right on my knees, hands lifted up. I don't care.
care who was looking at me. I was thanking and praising God. I said, God, your will be done in my life, whatever you want to do. There's a difference between walking in the spirit and walking in the flesh. My flesh did not want to walk home. But God has other plans, and he has other plans for you. Amen? Let's bow in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you. God, we desire to walk in the spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Father, as Anna and her family go back to the places that they live and as her husband goes back into the service, Father, lead them by your spirit. Father, we thank you for their life. God, thank you for another opportunity to be able to pray for them. And Lord, we pray that you would bless them with peace and joy and love and long-suffering and meekness and temperaments and guidance. And Father, that any situation or problem that they may be facing, let them know that if they include you in that problem, that they will find a solution. Father, bless their travels as they go. Surround them with your holy angels and protect them as they go. Father, we're so blessed to have them in our service today. God, bless them in Jesus' name. Father, we ask that you bless the remainder of us, Father, with your holy presence as we walk out your, this walk during the week, that, Lord, we would redeem the time, for the day is evil. And we know that you're coming soon. So, Lord, we don't want to have to get ready for you. We want to be ready. So we thank you and we praise you and we give you all the glory and all the honor and all the praise in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. God bless you this morning.